I'm going to share with you two messages. What? Two messages? Same length? No. Well, yes, actually. We're going to be here till about 4 or 5 o'clock till it starts snowing again. I'm going to shorten both because I just can't release both of these messages. When you consider uh, Jesus in his discourse, that's referenced to as the Sermon on the Mount. I've been there in Israel and being right at that spot. What a conducive environment for a group of people just to sit and listen to the Master as he taught them, and it's recorded in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. Most conservative scholars believe he did that all at one shot, one long discourse. And he, ch and he challenged the people with a variety of different topics. He moved from one topic to the next topic to the next topic. You almost wonder how you can connect the dots, but it was what was on God's heart and delivered. So I'm not going to deal with 10 or 12 topics, just two. And I'm going to follow the pattern here of Jesus because both of these really don't connect with one another, but I know that both are on his heart. Maybe if I were to define the first one, uh, the second one actually is the grip of strength, but the first one will be the grip of giving. And I want to share with you about that because it helped me when I was 15 years old. This illustration came to me many years later, but those who mentored me, those that I came under their tutelage that influenced my life, taught me at a very early age when I was 15 and I had just come to Christ and my occupation, my profession was I was a dishwasher at Tivoli Italian restaurant, cleaning dishes. And then after that, I would go caddy, carry a bag for about 18 holes and make five bucks. If uh, it was a good day, maybe they would give you $10. That was a really good day. But I learned as I got that money what I was to do with that. And they taught me the principle of the tithe. They taught me the principle of the offering. Now, I know for some of you, as it was for me when I embarked on a journey of studying the Old Testament, I took note of the fact that the tithe was taught, giving a tenth of whatever your earnings are. But I saw a glaring absence of it in the New Testament. So a question mark was in my mind, do we still tithe today? Well, that glaring absence was only a result of my personal ignorance because I didn't study more closely some of the statements that Jesus made himself, like in Matthew 23, verse 23, when he challenges the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and says, listen, you tithe, but you're missing the more important components of justice and love and mercy. But then he says, you ought to tithe, but do the other as well. So he wasn't negating that practice that's recorded in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Malachi. He was just making sure that we'd frame it out with the higher perspective, a higher understanding, an elevated revelation of what God's after when he invites us to give to him the tithe. Do you honestly think God needs your money? I know it's a rhetorical question. He doesn't need your money, but what he does need is our connection to him with a heart of obedience that then makes us ready to receive a blessing from him. We don't give to get, but our heart is, God, I want to be obedient to you. In the New Testament, you'll also see the example that's given of Melchizedek in Hebrews 7 that speaks to us there again about this whole understanding of giving and the tithe. Now, I've engaged in some polemics about this with others, and they've said, listen, I don't believe it. I think the Old Testament is, is dealing with the tithe and to give the 10%. Well, I capitulate. I said, okay, I won't argue with you. So let's move to New Testament theology. Guess what? You got to give your whole life. You got to give it all 100%. That's New Testament theology when it comes to giving. Everything. It's amazing how they then capitulate and say, I think I like Old Testament theology better. I'll stick with the 10% rather than the 100%. Think of it. Our government takes even more than 10%. Well, we won't go there. When it comes to that issue, I'd like you to see this illustration that maybe will bring it home. I'm going to ask Jeff if you'd come up. And let's just say Jeff is here. He's a believer in relationship with God for a moment, allow me the honor to pretend like I'm God, and I'm going to give to Jeff 
talents and abilities and gifts, things that will equip him, and it may come in all different forms, but for the sake of analogy and metaphor and illustration, I'm just going to say these are they're represented with oranges. So it, it could be a talent, a gift. It could be your actual finances. But, Jeff, there's one orange, and there's another one. You, you, there's another one. You doing all right? There's another one. That's four. Give you five. Six. Hang in there, son. I'm, I'm an abundant giver. Seven. Eight. No, no, we don't want to drop the gifts. Of... <laughs> All right, you're allowed one time. Very good. Nine. And ten. Good. Hold it there right under your beard. There. <laughs> All right. Now the Lord says, listen, I've blessed you. You might think, well, I've just got a little amount, you know. Whatever you've got. One talent, two talents, five talents, whatever you got. You say, thank you, Lord. And the Lord says, listen, I want to create a point of connection. Now, this is where it's not law. Remember the scripture says in John chapter 1, with Jesus came what? Grace and truth. With Moses came the law. It says with Jesus came grace and truth. My conviction? Jesus doesn't abort, nullify, negate dismiss the law. The scripture actually says he fulfills it. When you connect with him in a relationship, no longer is it an academic law. Now it becomes for you truth. The Decalogue is not dismissed, the Ten Commandments, but now you understand why you know K-N-O-W, why God says no and O. Because you're in relationship. Now the Law is not law, but it's become a truth to you. So here's the truth with the tithe and the offering. It's not a law. All right, I'll give God my 10%. Come on. That's so sterile, mechanical. No wonder there's sometimes a resistance. I see it as God inviting me to connect with him in an area that sometimes we all become insecure with, our finances. And so the Lord says, now, Jeff, I want you to connect with me. And the way that you can give expression of that is I want you to extend to me with your hand just one-tenth of this. I've given you ten. You know I'm the source. I've given it all to you. Hand me back one. So you go. Now watch out. Do you think God really needs the orange? You know what he loves going on here? That. That's what's going on. This is the truth. Just doing this is the law. So just give me the one orange. Yeah, you know this is what I want. This is what I want. And when you're connected with him this way, it's manifested through this, no doubt. Then he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bless you with a basket of wisdom. I'll give you this. Now go ahead, pour that all in there. There you are. Now, now, that wisdom I give you is going to help you steward and manage what you've got. You won't drop it all over the place. That 90% just won't slip through your hands. Oh, we're all out. Wallet's empty, purse is empty. Inventment went south. The pension plan, gone. Where'd all the money go? Well, you need wisdom. Not just an MBA. You need wisdom. Not just intelligence. You need wisdom. So this basket represents the wisdom I'm going to impart to you. So you will steward and manage and know how to elegate. And matter of fact... Luke 6, 38, you've given, you will receive back in abundance. Give, and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Does that define your motive? No, you don't give to get. I gave you 100, now give me back 1,000, God. You don't do that. 
it defines the inevitable results. When you give, the inevitable results, not what motivated you, but the inevitable results is abundant. So God says, you know what, now that you've got that basket, I can give you, you more. We'll give you some grapefruit. And you just, you, you good? I bet you could hold even more now, right? No problem, not juggling, not going to drop. Matter of fact, go feed the people with that. That's it. You got a basket full. But uh, remember, we have a third service, Jeff, and I need you to come back. <laughs> All right. Can I pray for you? Because I know that's a challenging area. I had one person come up to me and say, Pastor, if I had millions of dollars... I would give so much more. I said to them, with all due respect, no, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. Because the priority in your heart. See, it's not a loss of time or finances. It's the priorities that govern the decisions you make. If it's not a priority when it's small, that priority won't be there when it's big. You'll have another reason. I can't give that 100000 i I'm going to make this investment. Then when I get the return, I thought when I had a million. Now wait till I get two million or wait till I get a billion. Oh, I, I wish. We, <laughs> but if I wait till I get there, then I promise I'm going to give. Remember a guy, he, he's worth about $120 million. He told me 12 years ago, I'm going to give to your missions program big time. Never heard from him again. But that precious little, I got 10 bucks. Here's a dollar. I said, God bless you. I give her a big hug. She did it. You hear her do her. Yes? Now, I did this. There's no offering coming. I know if you're here, it's like, okay, is he going to pass the basket now? Nope. That's it. Just wanted you to hear the principle. You get it in your heart. You be obedient to God, not out of obligation, but out of obedience. It's a connection with your Father. Don't get all mechanical. It's a connection, and that connection bears so much fruit. Father, I pray this message that was burning on my heart would now be indelibly written upon your people. It's not something we're trying to get. It's something you're wanting to give to them now so they can always be secure with their finances because they're connected to you, the creator and the great provider. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll never forget when the Lord spoke to my heart and said your security regarding your future is not based on how much you have saved. It's based on how much you've given. That's paradox. But he spoke that to my heart. And that's why for me, for Diane, you know, we do the tithe, but we do the offerings, and he has always taken such good care of us. It really amazes me, I, and how he does it in really unique ways. Remember, I, I exited from a, a drugstore, and I, these two guys were talking. He said he was getting married, and he was all so excited, and so we talked for a while, and I started walking back to my car, and I felt like the Lord said, now give him $50 for his, you know, for his future wedding. Fifty dollars. So I don't even know this guy. What if he uses it for drugs? We're near a drug store. So I, and I felt like the Lord was saying, because I'm, I'm about to bless you and I need you to just to connect with me here. So I remember I gave and he was shocked and it helped with a little bit of a witness. I couldn't believe it. The next day, someone comes, hands me $1,800. And then the Lord started telling us what to do with that. See, it's not just what he can get to you, but what he can trust can get through you. Because like, oh, yeah, 18000 I'm going to buy an even bigger snowblower. <laughs> My precious wife did allow, not, not allow me, we engaged in a discussion. But she, she thought at first it was just going to be a big toy. But I told her this summer, I really want us to, you know, put money aside and, all, and get a really big, big snowblower. Oh, big babies, not this. <laughs> and my neighbor had just boom, a big one. I want one as big as him. you're not supposed to cover your neighbor's goods. I wasn't. I don't think I was. I just wanted to make sure mine was bigger. <laughs> so we got it. Was I vindicated? Huh? It's coming again. 
at four o'clock. That thing is so strong. I, my car was parked and oh, there goes the bumper. <laughs> second message. Second message. Yes, second message. I'm going to say it quickly. The grip of strength. I believe that God wants to speak hope deep into your heart. If there's a place of weakness that you need to receive his strength to overcome. That might be simplistic, but God knew you were here. He knows the areas where you're vulnerable. He knows where there's that propensity to fall into a a weak spot in your life. He knows your Achilles heel. He knows the place that you want to stuff into a closet because you're embarrassed that it's been a battle or a struggle, not just for weeks or months, but for some of you years and decades. He wants to touch that area with his strength. There's a portion that's found in the Old Testament. Can you just turn to it quickly? Isaiah chapter 40. If you don't have your Bible, we've provided one for you in the pew rack in front of you, that burgundy color book. Or use your electronic device. Pull out your smartphone, your tablet, your iPhone, your iPad. Don't go on games with it, but go to Isaiah 40. Just want to read these four verses The great prophet Isaiah is a prophet of the 8th century. He's ministering to the people of Judah. He was known as the statesman prophet because he was very articulate. His rhetoric was profound and he had uh, the ability to govern and administrate logistics and the such. But he knew the heart of God and he had the heart of God. When you look at the book of Isaiah, you know, there are some scholars, primarily liberal, who conclude that from Isaiah 39 on that it was never penned by Isaiah because of the content, the structure, the language, the syntax. They just feel authorship now is in question. I think that can be easily dismissed if you just study that a little harder, a little longer. And it's the prophet Isaiah from chapter 1 all the way to the close of the book. The book of Isaiah is kind of second as far as quoted from the New Testament The most quoted book in the New Testament of the Old Testament is the book of Psalms. And Jesus will quote more from the book of Psalms than any other book of the Old Testament. But second is from the book of Isaiah in its quotations within the New Testament as well as from Jesus himself. A very significant book. And contained in this portion of Scripture in Isaiah 40 and verse 28, it starts by saying this, have you not known, now listen, it's addressing the issue of strength. So if you feel weak in a certain area, others might know about it or it's completely private to you. Have you not known, have you not heard? Rhetorical questions, but reflect on it in your heart. The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. If you'll look up here for a moment. They that wait upon the Lord. That's the very first clear biblical principle in establishing a point of connection with God whereby where you're weak, you can become strong. There is a place of hope. I don't care as you reflect on your past. In whatever area that might be, it might be an area where there's a hindrance or it might be an area of sin in your life, that weak place. Listen, the devil is not omniscient, nor is he wise, but he is intelligent. He can connect the dots and take note of where you're vulnerable and then shoot his arrows right there. Your weak point will become his focal point of assault and attack. But our Lord, he is omniscient and wise and profoundly strong as articulated and clearly delineated here in this portion of scripture. Our God is capable of placing into you and into me strength 
in the weakest and most vulnerable areas of our life, be it in your mind or with your emotions, your actions or conduct, be it with your disposition or your personality, be it in an area where it would be with stress or anxiety or fear or insecurity or areas of sin like anger or bigotry or cheating or lying or stealing or lust or adultery. Wherever it might be found, God wants to move into that area and make you strong. He wants to move into that area and make you strong. And what he says here is, wait upon me. Now that is not an invitation to passivity or apathy. It doesn't mean your will is insipid. It doesn't mean it's disengaged. Actually, the word wait in the tongue of the Old Testament, the Hebrew language, doesn't communicate the idea of time or duration, but of relationship and connection. Not time or duration, but of relationship and connection. The very derivation of the word in the Hebrew means to wrap oneself around, around, around. So it means you move toward the Lord and you wrap your intellect and your emotions, your feelings, your desires, your dreams, your aspirations, your hopes, your failures, your weaknesses, your strengths, your insecurities, your place of confidence, wherever it is, you wrap it around him. See, that's active. That's not passive. That's intentional. That's purposeful. You are wrapping your life around him. Not time, not duration, not looking at the clock, but relationship and connection. Like Jesus said in John 15, abiding with the Lord. That place, I believe, brings us then into a position of strength because you're connected to him. He's the source and the resource for the empowerment that you need to overcome and be victorious in that specific area. You see, there's areas in your life and mine, we struggle with an area where we fail, and then we come to the Lord, and with absolute sincerity, more than remorse, which is kind of an emotional response, like it says in Hebrews 12, it says of Esau, he came and he sought for forgiveness with tears, but it didn't matter because the remorse or the emotional catharsis of tears doesn't necessarily mean there's repentance. Repentance has to do with the direction in which you look. It may be complemented by emotions and feelings and tears, but it's never, never can those substitute for it. That's why it says he sought for this change with tears and nothing came. That's Esau. But when we come to the Lord, we don't come with remorse. We come with legitimate repentance because we turn in his direction. And so our failure then is brought before the Lord and we ask him to forgive us. And based on the promise in, in 1 John 1, 9, he says he's faithful to forgive us. Then we receive that forgiveness and then what explodes in us is a freedom and a liberty. John 8, Galatians chapter 5. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But the danger is we land on this conclusion. Our freedom means we're strong, and it doesn't mean that at all. You see, your arm that was ensnared by a chain now has been lifted. It's been freed. You failed. You asked for forgiveness, and a freedom has come over you, and now it's free, and you're waving that hand in praise and waving that hand in testimony, but you're ignoring the fact that you're not strong yet. You're only free, and I don't minimize that, but I'm accentuating the need for more. I need to get strong in this area of my life. Otherwise, you're vulnerable to one of the biggest things that besets Christians. Wow, I was set free from that anger, from that lust and pornography. I was set free from that bitterness. I was set free from that jealousy, that envy in my life. And I give praise unto God. I was set free from that captivity in my life. I give praise to the Lord. 
And then there's a temporary silence because, as I said, the devil's intelligent enough to know that you're forming a conclusion, a dangerous one at that, that your freedom means you're strong. Then all of a sudden, you get visited by the temptation. You succumb. You're personally embarrassed. Where you were free, you're now bound again. What happened? Well, your deliverance was legitimate, but you didn't sustain it with discipline. Your freedom was real, but you didn't advance it to that place of strength. Because when you move from failure to forgiveness and you stop at freedom, you don't get to Ephesians 6.10. Be strong in the Lord. When you come before him, you place this uh, barbell, this dumbbell, into your hand in order to develop the spiritual muscle so you have movement and you have spiritual strength that's being achieved because your discipline is sustaining your deliverance. And so you come before him. Say, Lord, I want to abide with you. I want to wait upon you. I want to wrap myself around you. And by that, I want to move from a position of being free. I want to get strong. So when that temptation visits me to become jealous, to throw in the towel on my marriage and consider the door of divorce, when that temptation comes to me, I won't be overtaken by it because that temptation will be met with a strength that comes from you. Ephesians 4.13, be strong in the Lord, Ephesians 6.10, but Philippians 3, 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, through Christ who strengthens me. Now, what I'm about to share with you might seem paradoxical to just what I've said because I'm going to zero in on the weakest areas of your life. Where are you personally Weak and extremely vulnerable. Where is it? I don't think you have to visit that for very long because all of us can land maybe in the private chambers of your own mind or your own heart. But we know where we are weak and where we're vulnerable. And the scripture says in Hebrews 12, 1, lay aside that weight, and the weight that's being referred to there is something that's kind of amoral. It's not an ethical issue. It's not right or wrong. It's just a distraction for you, a, a hindrance. And like I said earlier, it could be that anxiety, that fear, that stress. It could be a man-pleasing spirit. It could be performance. Whatever it might be, it just holds you back. It impedes your ability to advance forward. Lay aside every weight that jeopardizes your freedom and your strength. And the sin, Hamar Hamatia, which so easily ensnares you. I want you to see something here. That phrase there, easily ensnares you, when translators try to handle that, it's difficult. That's why when you look at various versions, it's said in different ways, encircles you or cleverly gets around you and all that. Because these three words, these, uh, the so easily ensnares, is actually one Greek word. It's an adjective, and it's only used in one place in the entire New Testament. So contextually, it's very hard for the translators to get a meaning of the word because they not only look at the word itself, but how it's used in its context, and you can't find it. But one thing you do discover about this particular word that's used here is the word around. Think now, what did I say earlier? They that wait upon the Lord, what is the Hebrew word for wait? To wrap oneself around. And here it says, and the sin which easily can get around you. What does that say? This is what it says to me. If I don't do this, this is where I'm going to end up. If I don't wrap myself around him, and I know that may seem abstract and conceptual, but get into the chambers of prayer, get into the chambers of his word, get in fellowship with others, eat his will and do it every day. Just wrap yourself around him. If you don't wrap yourself around him, sin will wrap itself around you. And you'll be bound. 
that place where you're weak, vulnerable, you succumb to that temptation, you collapse, the unforgiveness, the bitterness, the anger became volatile, the profanity happened again, the drinking, the pill that was for pain now has become a drug of addiction. You know where I'm at. That look, that flirtation, that pornography has now evolved into a consideration of an actual affair where you're weak. The greed, I made a little, I got to make more. The coveting, lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares you or gets around you, ambushed over and over again in that area. Your weak point actually becomes that breaking point. And so, yes, we talked about waiting on the Lord and building that spiritual muscle with the weight of his word. But there's that place in your life that um, when things start happening and it hits it, it splits you and there's separation. It just... The knee of temptation hits it, and the knee of temptation hits it, and it just splits it. And, you know, the crack is there, and so you try to put it back in and superglue it with your own self-energy and effort and tape it with your own self-will and hope it stays. Hope you don't get hit there. And like in a fight with the devil, you think he plays fair, that he would sign some non-aggression pack or say, hey, look, I wear glasses, so if we engage in a fist fight, don't punch me in the eye. Where is he going to hit first? Where are you vulnerable? Boom! When I used to wrestle, I know you have a big question mark around that. <laughs> you should see when I take this sport coat off. You'd be amazed. <sighs> when I used to wrestle... I have a stationary blood clot on my right leg right here. I used to go out and say, hey, listen, you know, let it be kind of like skill against skill, match, match, right here, if you don't mind. I remember that. Do you ever these wrestlers, they usually don't have necks. So I'll tell you. I say, you know, don't grab me. Don't grab me there. If we could just make this a legitimate. What happened every time? We'd start grappling. Grab me right here. Oh, 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 oh. It was it. It was over. If you, if you have what I have here, you'd know if you squeeze that. Like I just did right there. This sermon's about over. <laughs> weak place. So you know where the devil knows you're weak, you're vulnerable. That's where he's going to consistently hit. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Thanatos, literal translation, separation. The results of sin is separation, splitting. So what do, you, what do you do with this area? Well, I think the Apostle Paul gives us the very quick, swift solution. He makes a statement at first read. You wonder why it even found its way into the canon of the New Testament. How could this be inspired? 2 Corinthians 12, 10. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. That's a contradiction. That's not even a paradox. That's a glaring contradiction. Well, the reason Paul could say that is because what God told him before that in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made complete in weakness. Now we get to the title of the message. The grip of strength is not yours, but God's. See, when you say, okay, Lord, forgive me, Free me. You've delivered me. I'm there. Now, Lord, seal this with the strength of your grip. Lord, you hold that area in my life. That's why it says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength, not yours, this is God's hand. My strength is made complete in weakness. That's the position. How do you get there? 
I think it's just two things we have to do, and I don't want to be mechanical with that. That's the grip. I like that. A fiery hand of Almighty God. Our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 24. Grips you in that area. A desperate cry. I know the areas where I'm weak, where I'm vulnerable. Then I know the areas where I'm really weak and really vulnerable. And it snaps quickly and separates. I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. You take note of the fact there's persistence, there's diligence, there's desperation. doesn't even say anything about faith there. They just looked in his direction, like the apostles on the boat. There, there was a climate of fear. There wasn't faith. But in their cry of desperation, because they looked in his direction, he performed a miracle. The father is crying for his son, help me with my unbelief. Does Jesus avoid him? Wait till your tank is full of faith. No, I'm going to meet you right where you're at because your cry of desperation is causing you to look in my direction, so I'm going to intervene. I'm going to help you. That cry of desperation may not be with tears. It may not be with crying. It may not be with a catharsis of emotions. I remember in a great revival under Charles Finney, a gentleman ran up to the front and started saying, <laughs> I'm so, I'm, and he tapped him. He said, go sit down. I don't want remorse. I want repentance. See, the desperate cry is looking in his direction and genuinely saying, sincerely saying, God, you alone are the answer. If that's where you're at, maybe it's just beginning this journey for you, or maybe you're really ready to say, you know what, I'm so tired of being weak in that area of my life. I'm so tired of that being the defining place of who I am, and no one knows about it. It could be actually with your physical weight, or it could be with, with a particular sin. I don't know, but you're just saying, I'm so tired of that area getting put together and snapping and snapping and snapping. I want it sealed with your strength, God, that where I am weak, now I am strong. And I am what I am. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 10. I am what I am by the grace of God. There has to be that desperation. You do it by looking in his direction. Yes, with your intellect, complemented maybe by your emotions, but most of all by you saying, I look in your direction, Lord, so I can receive now the second thing that I believe is key here, a direct promise. Paul said it this way, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. You see, when you look in his direction, this becomes more than a, a literary textbook. It becomes more than a Bible that's quoted. It, it becomes more than just an academic sterile event in your life of memorizing Scripture because the Scripture says the letter can kill, but the Spirit gives life. It becomes more than just his written voice. It becomes his spoken voice to you. Why? Because you're looking at him. See, Paul didn't say, after much study... After digesting the, the Tanakh, the Old Testament would be what he would be studying. I arrived at this. He says, no, he said to me. You see how personal that is? This becomes rhema to the heart. He said to me, this is my word for you. You know what happens? Like it happens in Genesis in chapter 1, God's word then gets into you. What makes you strong? A meal that you observe or a meal that you eat? A good meal that you eat is the correct answer. When you take it on the inside. So when you desperately look in his direction like the Apostle Paul did at his place of weakness. So we're in good company. And the Lord then spoke to him like he did in Genesis. When his voice comes over Paul, it gets into him like an eaten meal. And then a great strength explodes on the inside of him. His word, Hebrews 4.12, is living and active. It comes on the inside of you. And then like the scholars will say of Genesis 1... Ex nihilo, out of nothing came something in you. 
You're bankrupt. I don't have the strength in here to deal with this bitterness, to deal with this lust, to deal with this bigotry or this arrogance or this jealousy or this anger. I don't have the strength in me to deal with this perfectionism that just gets the better of me and just holds me down and impedes my ability to advance or impairs my ability to see. I am bankrupt. Nothing in here. But when you look in his direction and he says to you this word, my grace is sufficient to you. And it gets out of just your intellect. It's more than just cerebral, more than just academic or philosophical. It gets into your heart. Strength will explode on the inside of you. That which was not there comes into existence. His voice brings out of nothing something. And that something is your ability to say, I am strong in the Lord in this area. He holds me together. And all praise, honor, and glory goes to him. Amen. Let's stand together. I'm going to ask you just to let this be right where you're standing, the last two minutes of this service, to be your own altar. All the altars will always be open. There'll always be leaders up here ready to pray for you. If you've never received Jesus Christ to be your Savior and your Lord, I encourage you to invite him into your heart and say, Jesus, I don't want you on the outside. I want you on the inside. That's why Jesus described himself like a meal. You have to partake of me. You have to take me on the inside. Receive me as your Savior, the forgiver of your sins. Receive him as Lord, the ultimate leader of your life. I encourage you, if you've never done that, let today be the day. Today's the day of salvation to invite Jesus to come into your heart to be your Savior and your Lord. But for all of us that are here, I'd like you just to hear this song as Pastor Matt sings it. And let this just be a moment between you and God. I know God spoke something to you. I don't know exactly what. He'll shape it to you personally. But it's, it's Paul said, and it's standing out to you. as his voice right to you. I don't know what it was. But I know he spoke because that's been my prayer. I want you to hear the shepherd, the Lord, through me to you. That's my desire. And where he spoke to you, would you deeply receive that? And let him give you hope that in your weakness, his strength will be made complete and his grip of strength, his grip of strength will be more than sufficient in your life. And I want to pray a benediction over your life, a blessing, if you'll receive this. And of course, at the end of the service, if you'd like special prayer, the altars are open. There'll be leaders here ready to pray with you. I pray this blessing now upon your life. That that which is on God's heart would be indelibly written upon yours. That a new revelation, a new understanding, a, a new depth of intimacy with Him would arise in your life. That you would know the hope He gives to you. That in your weakness, God's strength, His mighty strength will give you victory. I pray that you would be blessed with this truth in mind and in heart. In Jesus' name I pray this blessing upon you now. Would you say I receive this? So let it be. Give a hug to that person next to you. God bless you. Good to see you.